Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series for October, November, and December of 2016 is on the book of Job. Wow. I hope you enjoy the book of Job as much as we do. And uh, we'll just find out exactly as we move along here. This is lesson number six in that series entitled The Curse Causeless. Wow, what could that mean? This is the lesson for November 5 of 2016. And as we begin, I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we say a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we see the accusations being made against Job, when you have already called him blameless and upright, uh, it's hard for us to understand what's going on. It must, in fact, be the work of the devil. Who else would do such a dastardly thing? But let's look at the material. Let's study what's being said in here. And let's think about the fact that God chose to preserve this material for us to study. May we get from it what we need to get is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's start off. What do we know about Job's three friends? Not much. They don't speak very much <laughs> initially. <laughs> initially. Yeah, they sat quiet they for a much. whole week. And then they said a, whole, said a whole lot of nonsense, didn't they? Well, there's pretty good evidence that uh, Timon, from which Eliphaz came, is in northwestern Arabia. Shua is an area of apparently in the northeastern Arabia, though not everybody agrees with that. And Naama is a common name. Uh, there are a number of villages and cities in the ancient times with that name, so we're not sure where that is. Uh, so it's difficult to know exactly where these people... Now, we, we should say that there was an ancient spice route that ran across the northern part of Arabia, what we would call Arabia today, and it's quite possible that both uh, Bildad and, and uh, I'm sorry, both Eliphaz and Bildad lived somewhere along that spice route. So, but the question that comes up in my mind, and I hope it does in yours as well, these people, according to the, that information, these people lived hundreds of miles apart. I mean, how often did they get together? It's not like they could jump on a jet and zoom over there. How often, how did they get to be Job's friends? Did Job travel to those remote areas and meet them there? We just don't know. So what kind of, how, how did the information get to them that Job was, had, had gone through all these disasters? We don't know. Was it somebody on one of the trade routes that just carried the message? Or did uh, someone in Job's area, some member, maybe one of, remote member of Job's family that hadn't been plagued uh, carry the message to these people because, in fact, they were Job's friends? We don't know. Well, how would you know how far away they lived? Well, we know from ancient documents that where Taman is, Taman is a known city. Shua is an area. It's not a city. It's an area. And then uh, Naamah, I told you about Naamah, Nama, I guess it should be correct. Uh, spo spoken. Um, there's a lot of cities around in that area by that name. Nama means pleasant. And so... Well, why, why, would, why would a person be named after a city? I mean, couldn't it be that, that the no, name... Th these, are, these are the places they're from. From. I know, that's yeah. all from their... From yeah. The places they're from. It's does not, it, not the does it tell... Does it tell where they're from like that? Yeah. Just uh, back in chap beginning of chapter 2, is it? It must be really brief because I can It is very brief. <laughs> uh, let's just look at that for just a moment. I believe it's at the beginning of chapter 2. It's, it's, no, it's but toward the end. From it's, yeah. it's 11, 11 verse on. 11 of chapter 2. Yeah, let's just read that. Three of Job's friends were Eliphaz from the city of Taman, Bildad from the land of Shua, and Zophar from the land of Nama. When they heard about Moshe, we've been suffering, they decided to go and comfort him. So that information is there. Okay. That almost suggests that they independently heard mm -hmm. and independently 
got together because they didn't have email, telephones. Uh, no email? How can you survive? Well, the, the, there's one thing. There's a, there is a modern day, in quotes, the Bush Telegraph. Mm -hmm. And if there were camels moving through there on a trade route, it's a pretty fair idea that things... I'm, if Job was as wealthy as the Bible says he is and something happened to him, word would get around. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question about that. Well, suppose you've traveled 100 miles or 200 miles or something to come and see this friend of yours that you know is in dire straits and having all kinds of problems. Um, what, would you, what would you do? What would you say when you got there? Would you dare to hug him? Or even touch him? Did Job want to be t hugged? No. I doubt it. Probably not. Did, did, is there any evidence that, the, that, that Job's friends made any serious efforts to find out why these things happened to him? Or did they just assume? Well, they asked no questions or anything for seven days, which, you know, and sometimes it's said, you know, when you're trying to comfort somebody, you know, the less said, the better, you know. Yeah. So just being there with the person, but And that's what we heard last quarter, wasn't it? Sometimes it's good to just go and sit in silence. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's what Job's friends did. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then they started talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the um, seventh trumpet in Revelation, the, the margin seems to point to that time also that Job was, um, his friends were quiet at all mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. So, might okay. be some information there. That, is important. Well, Job, of course, broke the silence by cursing the day he died, he was born. We talked about that last week. And now it's time for these guys to say something. They decided, I guess, since Job had broken the silence, they could speak up. Um, do you think Eliphaz received his nighttime vision while he was at Job's place? Now, I guess we need to, we need to look at that. Mm. So we, we, we all are together what we're talking about here. Let's, that would be um, Job 4. And I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's several verses, but not these are short verses. Job, will you be annoyed if I speak? I can't keep quiet any longer. And who's speaking? Here? This is Eliphaz. This is the, apparently the leader of the group. You have taught many people and given strength to feeble hands. So he recognizes that Job has learned a lot of good things in the past. When someone stumbled, weak and tired, your words encouraged him to stand. Now it's your turn to be in trouble, and you are too stunned to face it. You worshiped God, and your life was blameless. So he admits what God has said, right? And so you should have confidence and hope. Think back now. Name a single case where a righteous person met with disaster. Job. <laughs> well, so, I mean, immediately Job says, I can just see Job sort of jerking his head back. Okay, what's coming next? What are you trying to imply? Yeah, exactly. But what are you saying straight out? I have some people. Yeah. Well, Joseph, uh, of course, he had may have engendered some of the feelings against him, but mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, treated rather, rather poorly, and and things went from bad to worse, and. Mm -hmm so forth and so on. So that would be a, an example of somebody who was righteous but still yeah, yeah. got into trouble. Uh, and there are others. Um, obviously Enoch, we would say. We, we don't know very much about him. Uh, Daniel. Abel. Mm, yeah. Well, I have seen people plow fields of evil and sow wickedness like seed. Now they harvest wickedness and evil. Like a storm, God destroys them in his anger. Now was, I can see Job saying, hmm, is he, is he trying to suggest that God should do that to me? The wicked roar and growl like lions, but God silences them and breaks their teeth. Like lions with nothing to kill and eat, they die and all their children are scattered. And then these incredible words, once a message came quietly, so quietly I could hardly hear it. Like a nightmare it disturbed my sleep. I trembled and shuddered. 
My whole body shook with fear. A light breeze touched my face. Now remember, the, same, the word for breath, for breeze, the word for spirit is all the same word. And my hair bristled with fright. I could see some, something standing there. I stared but couldn't tell what it was. Then I heard a voice out of the silence. Can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before his creator? God does not trust his heavenly servants. He finds fault even with his angels. I wonder who Satan's talking about there. Do you think he will trust a creature of clay, a thing of dust that can be crushed like a moth? Someone may be alive in the morning but die unnoticed before evening comes. <clears throat> All that he has is taken away. He dies still lacking wisdom. He introduced this saying, it's in this, this section from verse 12, saying it's incredible. That usually suggests a positive thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he meant it that way. Well, try to put yourself in the position of Job. And try to put yourself in the position of Job's three friends. <coughs> Excuse me. You feel more comfortable in the position of Job or the position of Job's three friends? Now, I'm not talking about whether you would be hurting more if you were one of his friends or whether you were Job, but you commiserate more with Job. Now, unfortunately, we know chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 42, so it sort of biases us. A lot of us have had experience with people who are suffering. Um, well, Job would have more conflict in his, you know, why is this happening? Whereas the friends, they seemed to think that they knew exactly they why They knew, oh yeah, they knew. So, um, But where did they get that evidence? Well, isn't that kind of a natural thing? I mean, we almost have to learn that, that, that God punishes primarily because of behavior. And if you get punished, that means you're doing the behavior wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I okay. mean, we learned that growing up. Well, well it's not just there that we've learned it. We learned it from the Bible. Of course, that section of the Bible probably wasn't written yet. I think it's, what is it, Leviticus and Deuteronomy both have strong yeah. statements, str whole chapters saying that. Yeah. Well, but you see, the point is that they're looking at him. They see him suffering terribly. They know all the losses he's had. And so they assume he must have considered, done something terribly wrong. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. They're now, just if assuming. You see, if you see ice, do you assume that it's cold? Or if you see smoke, do you assume there's fire? Well, yeah. So why? I don't know why you have to be so hard on them. Well, to... I'm, just, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm, and the point is that we know chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 42. That's right. Which clearly shows that they were wrong. So, but for some reason, Job said, yeah, it's not that way. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the rest of the book of Job will be taken up with dialogues back and forth. One of them speaks, and then Job responds. One of them speaks, and Job responds. One of them speaks, and Job responds. So we, not, we must not forget in this whole process that Job 1 and 2 and Job 42 are the most important parts of the book. Why do we say that? Because those are the parts that describe the great controversy, the, the, the real underlying conflict here of... Satan and God in confrontation, and mm -hmm. and discussion. And the real explanation of what happened to Job and why he was in this situation, right? But I would say the other parts of Job is just as important, actually, because it, it amplifies the other that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and, well, it, and it kind of says, believe it or not, look, look at this. Mm -hmm. you no? Know? Yeah. It amplifies by being by and by the being the opposite yeah yeah so in looking forward toward toward the the dialogue between job and his friends we will discover that there were a number of facts and this is a key point in looking at the book of job there are a number of facts about which they all agreed there was no argument between them and job about whether god was sovereign but we read in job 42 7 and 8 god says 
What does it say over there? Let's read it once again. Maybe I just ought to read it once, in case we've forgotten it. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you, and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. We're going to talk about a lot of deserving in this book. Who deserved what? God says they deserve to be disgraced. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Wow. So how do you, how do you respond to comments like that when it's God speaking? Well, first of all, you look at all what these other guys said, there's nothing underlined where they did it wrong. You got to go through and try to okay. figure it out for yourself what's exactly. wrong. Exactly. So you have to look and try to say, okay, that, well, I already mentioned there's a lot of things about which Job and the friends agreed. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that can't be the things that God's upset about. So what we've got to find are what, what are the air, what are the things the points that Job made, in which they disagreed. Now the obvious thing is that Job was a terrible sinner. I mean that's up front from chapters one and two. They were sure Job was a terrible sinner, and Job was sure he was not. So that ought to be maybe up front. But how many how many other things and and what were their conclusions and what kind of conclusions did they come to? Well, another thing is that Job didn't get off scot-free either because yeah. the Lord kind of kind of waved his finger at him too mm -hmm. on some things. But it may not have been as bad. Can, as can you think of a time when God punished, if you will, for discipline purposes? Or does God only punish out of vengeance? What does vengeance mean? Vengeance means you're very upset and you've got to release your anger and you lash out. Well, God says vengeance is mine. I know. Well, I'm asking whatever you. vengeance is, it's his too. Yeah, I'm asking you. What does that mean? <laughs> Leave the vengeance to me if there's going to be some because I don't have any. Yeah, that could mean that too. Well, I well if, it's my, if it's his, that means it's there and he's got it. Doesn't mean uh, how God handled well, John. Could. That was discipline in the beginning. Well, no, it was mm -hmm. toward the end, wasn't it? He finally went and got some shade, and then a worm came and ate it. Actually, yeah, the truth again. the truth does have its own vengeance, doesn't it? Yeah. When you go against it, is 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 it ever easy to accept discipline? Especially especially when we're adults and we're sure that we're right. Well, Hebrews. 12 says that all dis discipline for the moment seemeth not to be joyful, but <laughs> yet sorrowful. Right. Yeah. Uh, but afterwards... Like it yields the free, peaceable, peaceable fruits of righteousness. righteousness. Yeah. I think if you're honest, maybe some of that, for want of a bit of word, violence might tone down. You realize you had it coming kind of thing. Yeah. That's fairly rare from what we see these days. Yeah. Self-justification is yeah. The, yeah. tends to be the rule. Well, obviously we live in a sinful world. There's no question about that. It was God's plan for us all to be living in the Garden of Eden. So we should take our share of the blame for the mess we're in. Right? So is there evidence? So, well, and so thinking now, since we're talking in terms of the great controversy, if you were a Satan... Where would you focus your attention? On the evil people, the sinful people, or on the righteous people? It depends where, how you understand his plan. Well, that's why I'm asking you. Uh, I, I really don't think too many people actually know what his plan is. Well, here's an example, 2 Timothy 3.12. Paul's about to be beheaded, and he's been in prison for years and years by this time different prisons and prisons in different places and he's writing to his young friend Timothy and he says everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted is that still true in our day yes and the 
go to watch the news and you can see that. Well, Jesus said that if uh, they hate me, <coughs> they'll hate you. So yeah. we're, we should expect to experience what Jesus experienced you know, to some degree yeah. or another. In this group, we have suggested, sort of briefly in the past, that the experience of Job and the experience of, the, of Jesus at the end of his ministry and the experience of the saints at the end of this world's history have a lot of parallels. Let's look at po that possibility. Throughout history, there have been many who have proved Satan wrong by relying totally upon their relationship with God. The righteous will be living those kinds of lives on this earth just before Jesus comes. Revelation 14, 1 to 5 and 15, 2. They too will stir up Satan's wrath and he will do all he can to destroy them. And now I'm going to quote from Ellen White, the book of Education, page 154. Unselfishness, think about this. Unselfishness, the principle of God's kingdom, is the principle that Satan hates its very existence he denies. From the beginning of the great controversy, he has endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish, and he deals in the same way with all who serve God. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and of all who bear his name. So who are we directly fighting against? Satan's Principalities and powers. Ephesians 6, yeah. I didn't quite get the, what the claim was. Well, the, the idea is Satan will, basically Satan say, is trying to say that nobody, nobody is truly motivated fully and completely by love. If we, if we look like, if it looks like we're doing something loving, underneath it somewhere there's selfishness that's motivating us to do that. Because that's, that's what motivates him. So he says, you know, the idea that someone, the, and this is part of the Job story, that's why we're talking about it. The idea that Job would do what's right just because it is right is totally, absolutely foreign to the, I mean, Satan can't even wrap his mind around it. Well, you talked about love and you talked about mm -hmm. doing things right because it is right. That's, that's pretty logical. Mm -hmm. But love is not really... Does it seem logical to Satan? What? <laughs> Either one of those things. Well, there's a lot of different kinds of emotion. Yeah. It's just whether or not you've got control over some or other, some yeah. or not the, the other. And then you've got the logical part. You've got, we've got two things that are fighting here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, defining what is right uh, might help because we all think we're right. Every man, uh, everyone thinks they're right. Uh, mm -hmm. Every man's way is right in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's God's will. It's God's, uh, as Jesus prayed, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So. His will is the right way, but mm -hmm. uh, the essence of Satan's kingdom is do your own will. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's what we see in society today also, pushing for everybody to just do whatever they want to do as long as okay. but, but they that, can handle that, it. That in itself I don't think is the problem. It's just when you do your will, you find yourself way over here, away from God. Mm -hmm. And that's, well, that position is where you really get it. Self selfishness is what motivates everybody on the side of Satan. That's, what they, that's why they're over there. Well, here's a very interesting passage. It's in Desire of Ages, page 471. It was generally believed by the Jews, this would be in the days of Jesus, that sin is punished in this life. Every affliction was regarded as a penalty of some wrongdoing, either of the sufferer himself or of his parents. You remember uh, John 9. It is true that all suffering results from the transgression of God's law. And like we already mentioned, we should be in the Garden of Eden. But this truth has become, had become perverted. Satan, the author of sin and all its results, had led men to look upon disease and death as proceeding from God, as punishment arbitrarily inflicted on, the, on account of sin. Hence, one upon whom some great affliction or calamity had fallen 
had the additional burden of being regarded as a great sinner. Thus the way was prepared for the Jews to reject Jesus. He who hath borne our sorrows and carried our, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows was looked upon by the Jews as stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, and they hid their faces from him. Isaiah 53, verse 4, and then verse 3. So why did they do, re regard Jesus as stricken and smitten? Well, he was from Galilee. Yeah. That was kind of the back water. Yeah. You know. Okay, that's part of it. Uh, what else? And, and they said that, uh, uh, trying to defend their position, that uh, go see, they said to Nicodemus, go see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, actually, Job was smitten. Yeah. And he was, he was that. We're going to talk that about position. that in just a moment. And, um, yeah. And when you look at him, then look at Jesus, you see some similarities there. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there's sin that's Well, but we, you, we have forgotten one of the things we've talked about many times. If you were good, according to their thinking, you would be rich. Was Jesus rich? No. No. He was poor. Therefore, he was a sinner, as far as they were concerned, by definition. And who was it had made that same error in the days of Job? Job's three friends. If you've lost everything that you had, what's the reason? You've got to be a sinner, right? Well, she goes on, Ellen White goes on to say, God had given a lesson designed to prevent this, this kind of thinking, I might add. The history of Job had shown that suffering is inflicted by Satan and is overruled by God for purposes of mercy. But Israel did not understand the lesson. The same error for which God had reproved the friends of Job was repeated by the Jews in their rejection of Christ. Wow. So what would that error be? The same error, let me read it again. The same error for which God had reproved the friends of Job was repeated by the Jews in their rejection of Christ. Desire of Ages 471, paragraphs 1 to 3. So what was that error? Judging people based on their status in society, the wealth that they have. Can their any, wealth and health. Mm -hmm. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Mm -hmm. Well, notice how Ellen White uses Isaiah 53 in this context. Ellen White went on to say that the Jews had not understood the book of Job. I wonder what they, what they said about the book of Job when they studied it. The book of Job is not just a question about one man's suffering. This is a basic question in the great controversy. Could this be part of what will trouble the people of God in the end? You think some of the same kinds of issues will come up in the end? So, are you asking if the the end is going to be a test of getting hurt, of suffering, oh. and that's, that's the whole point of the end? No, I, well, I mean, we're going to say, I'm going to say, I would like to say at least, that there's a great controversy going on. Mm -hmm. It's clearly spelled out in the first two chapters of Job. It's going on right now. Too. It's going on right now. And at the very end of this world's history, when Satan knows that he is He's up against the deadline that, that if, if, if this group forms, if God's friends come together and coalesce and are faithful to him, what happens to Satan? It's curtains for him. It's all over. This is a life and death issue for Satan. Yeah. You think he's going to just sit, sit by and watch it happen? No. Not a chance. Well, so here's the question. Uh, Job's friends believe that God always rewards the righteous and always punishes the wicked. Is that a fair, is that a valid assumption to start with? Yeah, I think so. And there, there have always been doubters somewhere along the line. I'm thinking more that in our time and even leading up to Adventism as we know today, there's always been a few doubters and gotten cold feet and moved mm -hmm. on. Okay. But does, does, does God always reward the righteous 
and always punish the sinners? Absolutely not. No. Well, uh, I wouldn't say that. I would say if you had a timeline mm -hmm. of, you know, when the, the spectrum. You mean when the when the end comes, where the final punishment comes, it'll come sometime. It's mm -hmm. just that some people it's shorter, longer, yeah. Yeah. and you might have a good stretch there where the sinners are getting pretty well off from that. But I think at the end. Um, what we're going to see both Eliphaz and his other friends say sooner or later as we work through our way through the book is, Job, we are certain that you deserve what happened to you. Would you dare to say that to somebody, a friend who is terribly suffering, suffering just, I mean, look at everything that Job suffered. Well, Job, you know, you deserve that. But if you believed it was coming straight from God's hand... What else would you, what else would you say? Well, that's well, the point. They, that's a, they had the wrong idea the wrong, uh, about where this came. Completely wrong picture of God. Well, if they got the wrong picture of God, didn't even Job say that the stuff is coming from God? Well, okay. And here we need to, we need to make a clarification. And, and I'm unfortunately, uh, in this lesson series, we sort of skip over chapter 9, and I would really encourage you out there to read carefully Job's response in chapter 9. And one of the questions, if you read especially my Good News Bible, which I like very much as I quote it very often, says, right, if God didn't do it, who did? So in Job's mind, and probably in their minds also, they had the idea that there is only one God, there's only one being out there that does these things. So if all this is happening to Job, I mean, we can't, we can't explain it because of some human that did it. It must have been God. So all four of them agree with that, though. Well, initially, they well, do. Well, initially, but still, if, if you're saying that, that their conclusion that, God, that, that Job did something wrong was the wrong thing, well, Job thought that, too. That's not, not on him, but he thought, well, and it was coming from God. And if, if it was coming from God, well, then what else can you conclude? Unless you don't believe that God is, yeah. is righteous. Yeah. Okay, so what, what we've already seen here is a couple of things. One, re, not forgetting Job 1 and 2, we've, we're, we're suggesting something very remarkable. That something that happened around the throne of God in heaven is having a direct impact on people living here in our world today. Now think about the implications of that. Most of, our peop most of the people who live in our world today, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that most of the people who live in our world today think that if, the, if they believe in God at all, they believe he's way up there somewhere and whatever affects him doesn't affect us. I mean, he could do something to us, but no, nah, he, you know, he's sovereign, he's way off there, he has his own business. It doesn't impact us at all. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, who's responsible for the evil? Now, Job was caught up with this idea, and, and we agree to a certain extent. We would say in our day, God has to either do it or allow it. Does that make him responsible? Why do we say that? Because he's all powerful, he could stop anything. Well, nobody can do anything without his permission. Okay, that's, that's my point. Thing. Why do we say that? Why do you say that? Why do I say that? Mm -hmm. Because he's the creator. He's the one that okay, gave but us you could, everything. You could, you could do it. freedom to do this stuff. You could be like a deist who said God just creates it, throws it out there and says, good luck, guys. Well, um... So it's not, you know, there, there are a lot of people, aren't, including aren't a lot of the that? founding fathers aren't of our... Are you saying that, though? No, I'm not. Well, how else can you, how else can you not blame I, God I, for this? I just said that, that something that happened around the throne of God is impacting directly Job and his friends. And remember the first time when, I mean, the second time when, when Satan came up to God, he says, that you enticed me to do. That, that God had enticed, that Satan had enticed him to do. So okay. God did it. 
Okay, well, and what did God do? He permitted yeah. Satan to do it. He well, allowed. It says, you read it. It says, you right. enticed me to do it. Well, okay. So what's happening? That's a valid, a valid. So what's happening here? Someone on earth by the name of Job is carefully and lovingly following God's plan for his life. And this upsets Satan enormously. Satan wants to be a part of the Heavenly Council. He's going to, he wants to believe that this world is going to be his property and everybody here on this earth is, earth is going to follow his plan and his hope is eventually that God will say, okay, you just take planet earth, it's yours, you can do what you want with it, we'll have the rest of the universe, you just, that's yours. That's what Satan is hoping. And, God's, and God says, absolutely not. What happens on planet earth affects me, it affects Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it affects all the righteous, everything that's going on here affects us. So you, so, want, you, you think that God is, uh, Satan is trying to claim some land? Oh yeah, absolutely. You think so? All the way to the end, he's going he's to try to say to God, you know, okay, take the rest of the universe, I don't mind, just let me and my, my, my people have this earth. And God is going to say, I'm not only not going to let you have this earth, I'm going to make this earth my future headquarters. Uh, Why does God do that? So, so it is land. Well, it's, so it's land. It, it's that's so part, it's of it. part of it. Part of the part of it. Give me part of the universe. You can have all the rest, but right. let me do it over. You think that's the whole thing that he's trying well, to do? Why, and he's why? trying to stay alive. He, he's, he's you think trying. he's trying to stay alive? Yeah. yeah. Satan, oh, yeah. How can, you, how can he because be a king, king of death? How can he have a kingdom of death and want to stay alive? Because he's a, well, a celestial nutcase. He he no, it isn't. He doesn't I don't want to think be, so. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want. If Satan wanted to die himself, he should have done that a long time ago. No, no. He would want to die with everybody else. That's what I would think. He would want to die with everybody else. Yeah, if he could, if he could get everybody oh. to not want God, he could he could leave life and stab God in the chest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if he could, he would like to. Well, what he would really like is to kill God so he could take his place. No, I don't think he knows. He knows he can't do that. Well, but I think if he can get everybody to to go against him. Okay. And no. go against God. And we, need to, we need to keep moving. So in a sense, Satan is a terrorist and yeah. trying to set up, in the words of 2016, trying to set up a caliphate. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. The problem with Eliphaz's words, this is, words, this is a quotation from our Bible study guide. Eliphaz, the problem with Eliphaz's words isn't just the, question, is the questionable theology and the, his, his statements about God. The bigger issue is his insensitivity to Job and all that he's going through. Is that true? No. I wouldn't agree. In this lesson, we will consider Eliphaz's first response to Job. Look at Job 4.17 and compare the New King James Version with my Good News Bible. The New King James Version says, Job 4.17, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his Maker? Does that make any sense to you? Well, he's trying to still make that argument that he must have done something wrong. Does anyone ever claim to be more righteous than God? Well, my good other ways to translate that. Yeah, my, my, my good news Bible says, can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be, be pure before the Creator, His Creator? And that's obviously the point that God and Satan were arguing about. So that makes a lot more sense to me. I thought they were arguing about whether or not Job would curse God in his face. Yeah, sure. That's well, I think that, that's probably his big aim right there. It's not a, not well, a, not a, uh, a degree of goodness versus badness. It's whether or not Job is going to end up cursing God in his face. Whether, whether Job is going to remain faithful no matter what Satan does to him. That's right. That's exactly... Well, the basically trusting. Yeah. Well, I would like to suggest, and I would encourage you out there to read very carefully the first couple of chapters. Try to think about, okay, what is Job say? I mean, what is God saying about Job? What is Satan saying about Job? And then read carefully chapter 4. 
and see whose side you think Eliphaz is really on. I am convinced that the one who appeared to Eliphaz in the middle of the night and gave him that vision was Satan himself. You, you see what you think. Well, in the next verse he says, he puts no trust even in his servants and against his angels he charges error. So yeah. it's, it's like he's arguing, uh, you know, we're all in the same boat. He's yeah. trying to put himself, you know, if you're going to save these people, then you should save me too. Exactly. We're all, we're all the same. Everybody is under God. Nobody can say anything to him necessarily, but uh, uh, I should be included in those if you if you have a plan, life. yeah, if you have a plan to save Job, you need to save me too. Yeah, I think this is even the memory verse. It is this week, isn't it? Yeah. The so-called memory verse, where the memory verse is quoting Satan or his, at least his his accomplice, if it's not Satan himself. Yeah. Should we be quoting Satan in a memory verse? Hmm. Well, we quote him in the Bible. Well, what what what? What effort, evidence did, did Eliphaz provide? What were his, what were his arguments to support, support himself? Do you remember? Well, in that verse, he's trying to suggest that it was a miracle. Look at what happened. I actually saw a vision of some supernatural being and he appeared to me. This is miraculous, Job. Well, I don't know exactly if he knew what he was saying. Would you, because, because um, they were saying Job did something wrong, mm -hmm. and this this uh, this ghostly thing says that nobody can do anything right mm -hmm. with God. But the only thing that's really wrong is that 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 God accuses them of not doing things right. Hmm. Well, hold on, I'm not sure I followed you there. <laughs> in the um, in the ghost statement. Uh -huh. If you read that again. Yeah. Can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before his creator? And? You want to? Well, that means, that means, what's the question? The question is that no, you can't. Well, and, and that's exactly what Satan, see, God said right up front, before Satan had said a single word, anything like this, before the entire, all of the, the lead people in the whole universe all gathered there. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless and upright. Well, blameless well, and upright, is, what does that mean? Well, so, so the, we have the same thing uh, in Revelation where it says, well, who can stand? Yeah. You know, calls, they call for the rocks to fall on them and they mm -hmm. say, who can stand? And that leads into the 144,000 in the next chapter. Yeah. So uh, that's part of Satan's um, accusation that nobody can stand. Yeah. Nobody's going to do. Well, and, and Satan would say, all these people here are sinners. God, are you going to save them and you're going to destroy me? How can you do that? And that would be his argument. Well, the incredible thing about Eliphaz's speech is that he honestly seemed to believe that he was defending the character of God by quoting the devil. Now, he didn't believe he was quoting the devil, but that's what he was doing. In Colossians, Paul warns uh, about uh, people who take uh, his stand on visions he has seen inflated uh, without cause by his fleshly mind. Mm -hmm. uh, same same kind of thing, yeah. Colossians 2, 18. Um, so not everything that, that, that Eliphaz says is wrong. He says, you know, look at our lives. They're so short. In, in terms of eternity, our lives are very, very brief. And, you know, just reminding us once again that Satan will always mix in a lot of truth with his falsehood. And he's hoping you won't be able to distinguish between the truth and the falsehood. And our lesson study calls it very sound theology. Hmm. Well, is the, is the devil capable of sending visions to us in the night? Could that happen to one of us? There's 
certainly can appear. Well, God says that he will. Mm -hmm. And if we had time, and we're already running out of time, but it would be interesting to sit down and compare the statements of Eliphaz with the statements of the scribes and Pharisees. Very interesting. <coughs> but once again, we should make it very clear that the idea that God is sovereign, that he's ultimately responsible, Job believed that, the friends believed that. So that wasn't one of the points about which they disagreed. Well, what the friends, however, believe that God has to b reward the righteous and he has to punish the wicked. Did Job believe that? I and, know that he rested on that idea, mm -hmm. but he struggled with why things changed. Mm -hmm. Does evil bring its own punishment? <clears throat> Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mm. There's that passage in Galatians. Mm -hmm. uh, if you sow to the flesh, you reap destruction. If you slow, uh, sow to the spirit, you, you reap eternal life. So here, let's take the case of Eliphaz and Job here. We know, having read chapters 1 and 2 and, verse, and, and chapter 42, we know that ultimately all suffering is a result of ultimately sin, right? We should all be living in the Garden of Eden in perfect peace and happiness, right? So we know that all the suffering, any suffering you want to pick out, wherever it is, ultimately it, it's a result of sin. That's true. So is, is suffering sin? No, no, it's no. Not sin. Get results Result. from sin. Results of sin. Yeah. It's the results of sin. Yeah. Okay. Ultimately. So if uh, suffering is sin is is not sin. It's just a result. Mm -hmm. Could well, it be it, here without sin? Or does well, it we, always We come read with there sin? in Second Timothy three, uh, verse twelve. All who live righteous lives or try to live righteous lives will suffer persecution. That's suffering. That's right. Okay. 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 Well, Job goes on. I'm sorry, not Job. Eliphaz goes on and he says these words from Job 5, verse 27. This is part of his speech. Job, we have learned this by a long study. It is true, so now accept it. In other words, we have learned what? We have learned that God always rewards the righteous, and he always punishes the wicked. We know that's true. Our fathers taught us that. It's part of the research. Right? And, and we've confirmed it, is what he meant. And we confirmed. There was no Bible to check it out, though. No, there was no Bible in their day. I, I wonder if... But what's, he, what's he saying? I, I want you to think about the kind of argument he's making here. This is an argument that people use all the time. The idea is, well, Everybody knows that's true. So if you say everybody knows that's true, then what are you saying to the person you're arguing with? You're nobody. You're, you're nobody and you, you... And you're wrong. You're wrong. Obviously you're wrong. So that's another one of Elipaz's arguments. We know, Job. Everybody knows that. So get with it, right? Well, how often do people appear to appeal to experience or research without presenting the evidence? Does that ever happen in the medical field, Gordon? Occasionally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Occasionally per minute. You mean, you mean these three guys didn't have evidence for what they were saying? Well, what evidence did they provide? <laughs> they didn't have any. Well, yeah, they did. Life because, experience. no, I mean, I mean, people do suffer because of sin. Yeah. Well, that's evidence, isn't it? Well, but we're talking about specifically the case of Job here. Specifically, the case of Job. Yes. Well, that's what I say. If there's ice, you're probably going to find out it's cold. That was, and that's the point. You see, that's exactly the point. They looked at Job. They said, clearly, this guy is suffering. He's lost all his wealth. Therefore, we are going to assume he must have done something really wrong. That's where the problem is. Their assumption. Now, what would they know? What What would have told them that would have kept them correct on that? Well, 
what should have, what would have corrupted them, it uh, wasn't corrected. possible in light of the book of Job, but would have, what would have cor corrected them would have been knowing chapters 1 and 2. Well, that's true, but they didn't. They didn't. But, but that's, that's not even a, a point, but my, really. But my, yeah, but the point is this. Let's point at this. What I want to say is, did they know for sure that Job had sinned? And the answer is no. But they accused him of being the worst sinner you can imagine. He, they're gonna, we're going to see they even accused him of being responsible for the death of his children because he was such a sinner. And these, these assumptions were absolutely false. And they had but, no evidence for it whatsoever. But they follow, though. They follow. Well, lot, what, what, if, what if there was nothing contrary to this until Job came? And Job was the one that changed this, this whole idea. Okay. And if that was true, well then everybody was wrong. Maybe that's why Job was so, so special. Mm -hmm. You know, God said maybe yeah. he, he believed and he finally thought that maybe suffering doesn't have to necessarily come from sin. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you this comment from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 331, from, written by Ellen White. The Bible with its precious gems of truth was not written for the scholar alone. So the scholar is the one who does his research and looks everything very carefully. Do we have to be theologians in order to be saved? On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. And the interpretation given by the common people, when aided by the Holy Spirit, accords best with the truth as it is in Jesus. The great truths necessary for salvation are made clear as the noonday, and none will mistake and lose their way except those who follow their own judgment instead of the plainly revealed will of God. How often do we follow our own judgment as opposed to the plainly revealed will of God? Now, to your point, Gary, let me just mention, would it be, was it not fair of God to accuse it them of being, quote, he, in fact, he was actually angry at them in, in chapter 42 for misrepresenting him. There must have been some possibility of them knowing the truth, because other, unless you're going to accuse God of being wrong. Well, what if, what if this is the point where God is bringing that truth to everybody yeah. at that point, and he's making, it, he's making a, the point stick by being angry with them and being okay with Job? Okay. Let's, 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 let's watch that. Okay. We must learn to make up our minds for ourselves and based on evidence. Doesn't that mean asking a lot of questions and evaluating the answers, comparing them with Scripture? How will we be able to survive the time of the end unless we can do that? How often do, you, do we bring trouble upon ourselves by our own actions? Let's not forget, as we're discussing Job, what it says in James 1, 13 and 14. If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. And of course, ultimately in verse 15, those evil desires lead to death. And Ellen White adds, education, page 146, no truth does the Bible more clearly teach than that what we do is a result of what we are. To a great degree, the experiences of life are the fruition of our own thoughts and deeds. So, God had said that Job was blameless and upright. Job 1, 1, 8, 2, chapter 2, verse 3. Would a righteous God turn around and punish such a person? So if we read ch chapter 1 and 2, and we know what it says there. It depends on how you characterize his right. suffering. Is, is that punishment, or is it simply the result of Isn't it, living in a world of sin? Well, we're going to talk about that in the future lesson. So well, You sound like God's coming down with a whip for no reason at all and whipping him. That's what, that's what Eliphaz is preaching. Except Eliphaz was saying it's not for no reason. It's because Job deserved it. Yeah. And but his the, children deserved it too because they yeah. must have been horrible sinners. But, but the thing is that Job did nothing and yet he's getting whipped. Yeah, exactly. And Job's, Job's children are dead. What did they do? And nobody, you could ask all the people around. I mean, everybody, they lived in a town. 
There are people all over the place. There are people who worked for them. Could those people provide any evidence that Job or any of his children had sinned? And the answer is no. All except for the, the things that fell on him. Yeah. That's the only but thing. But you see, that you have to but draw that, that conclusion. Back, that is evidence back then. Well, they thought it was evidence. Well, after Job, you could say that. But maybe before Job, you can't say that. Okay. Well, we're running out of time. How little do we, and this is Ellen White again, how little do we enter into sympathy with Christ on that which should be the strongest bond of union between us and him? Compassion for depraved, guilty, suffering souls, dead in trespasses and sins. The inhumanity of man toward man is our greatest sin. Wow. And you can read the rest of that quotation, Ministry Feeling, page 163. By the way, our handouts are available online. You can go to our website, Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can get all this material if you would like to look at it yourself. Including the handout, If God Didn't Do It, Who Did, based yes. on uh, Job 9.24. Yes. Are we ever given the responsibility of judging others? Now, clearly, Job's three friends thought it was their job to, to judge Job. Has God ever given us that responsibility? Well, it's true that in Corinthians... Paul says the church needs to keep itself pure. So if people are openly sinning, they need to be pushed out until they, until they reform their ways. But lots of other verses say we shouldn't be judging. Well, even if Eliphaz had been right, and maybe Job was a little bit sinning, did they have a right to judge him? Well, if Jesus had been there, what would he have done? I guess that's the question we really ought to ask. We know so little about the things that cause people all kinds of problems, and yet we act as if we know all the answers. Well, our situation in 2016 is, of course, very different from the situation of Job and his friends. Professional counselors have talked about dealing with grief. Was, was that part of Job's problem? In our handout, you'll find four steps that are really important in dealing with grief. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this wonderful presentation of the challenges in the great controversy. We recognize the fact that the people who claimed to be, who were so sure they were right in the days of Jesus, had failed to learn the lessons from the book of Job. Help us not to make their mistake is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.